a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Isaac Neri. Um, Isaac uh, got his PhD from uh, KU Leuven in uh, 2010, I believe, in, uh, <laughs> in uh, disordered system. So he's a theoretical physicist, mathematical physicist, working on the interface between uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, stochastic process, but he worked on a broad range of uh, subjects, including disorder system, uh, random matrix theory. After his PhD, he, he had uh, several postdoctoral positions in Europe, including the prestigious Elbe postdoctoral fellowship uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Complex System in Dresden. And now he's at, uh, a senior lecturer at uh, King's College uh, London. So Isaac, it's a great pleasure to have you here at OIST. Okay, thank you very much, Simone. And yes, let me as well take the opportunity to thank Simone and Samuel for being such a great host at OIST. And as well, um, thank the administrative team for having so efficient organization and making everything so smooth. So in this talk, I will talk about spectra of complex networks. So the main idea of this kind of research is to understand how network topology affects the dynamical systems defined on graphs, um, examples being neural networks, ecosystems, basically anything that is large defined on a graph. So the approach that we follow is based on statistical physics. And statistical physics is basically we are studying systems with randomness. These can be small systems, can be complex systems. Um, and then we use probability theory and stochastic process theory to study systems that have randomness in the natural sciences. So in examples are, for instance, small systems. These are, in this case, there's a cilia connected to a cell. And you see this motion is stochastic. This is a typical statistical physics problem. We want to understand the fluctuations of this cilia. So what's interesting is that this motion is not thermal because there are molecular motors inside. So these are non-equilibrium fluctuations and we cannot apply standard thermodynamics to that. We need to develop a non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And so this is a, a topic of interest. And, but in this talk, I will talk about systems which are random for entirely different reasons. These are large systems systems consisting of many components. And the reason they're random is because if you look at interactions, this is a, an example of such a complex system, you don't see any clear symmetry, you don't see any clear structure. So the way we model such system is as a random system. So this is um, brilliantly visualized um, by Barrett Lyon, this is the internet. Each node is a, a network of computers and the connections or data connections between these computers. We also see that you can see this hubs here. The systems are not entirely random. You can see certain structures appearing. The way we model this kind of complex systems is using graphs. So graphs are fairly simple objects. These are a collection of nodes. These nodes are connected by edges, and that's it. So to study graphs, we like to use linear algebra. So we represent these graphs in terms of matrices. This is commonly done by the adjacency matrix. It's simply a matrix whose entries are either zero or one. An entry is one if there's an edge pointing from a node I to node J. An entry is zero if this edge is absent. So we often it's as well interesting to add weights to these edges because want to quantify the interaction strength. And there's two types of weights. There's weights associated to edges, we know them by GIJ. These appear as off-diagonal entries of the matrix. And then there are edges or weights appearing to nodes, and we know them by DI. And these appear as diagonal entries of the matrix. Oh, yeah, please. Sorry, I think uh, J connecting to I will also have one in the adjacency matrix, both the sides or... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So, but um, yeah, so this is for any pair of, of nodes ij. So you have ij at some point, at some other point you have ji. So yes, you have both. And importantly, they can be different. So gij is not necessarily equal to jji. So, um, yeah, so this is the, so we use these matrices to study these networks. 
So let me give you some examples of such networks. So one example of food webs. So in this case, each node represents a species. And there's a link between two species if one species feeds on the other. So these links in this case have antagonistic interactions, sign antisemitic interactions. And that's because, let's say, if a, if a girl eats a shrimp, that's bad for the shrimp, it's good for the girl. So these interactions are positive in one direction, the negative in the other direction. Um, this is the example for um, a bay, San Quentin Bay. It's a quite rich ecosystem. And it's fairly simple to get this network, but it's very difficult to get the interaction strengths of such networks. So these are, in general, not known. Let me give you now another example of such a complex system. This is a client supply network. It's a financial network. In this network, each node is a firm. And there's a link between two firms. If firm A supplies goods to firm B. So in these networks, it's fairly simple to get the interaction strengths. This is simply the number of goods supplied from one firm to the other. So this network is large. It has about 10,000 firms. This is simply a small part of the network. However, this data is not publicly available because these financial data are often provided by companies. And yeah, it's not publicly available. That's kind of an issue sometimes with financial data. And then let me give you a final example, which is interesting, which is our neural networks. So these are, in this case, each node is basically a neuron. And these neurons are connected by synaptic interactions. So in these interactions, you have chemical messengers which are transported. That's how these neurons interact. So what's interesting about these networks is they are directed. So about 90% of the interactions are directional, the other one or non-directional. These are largely directed networks. Uh, in this case, uh, we see the network of C. elegans. This is a worm and has a fairly simple neural network. It's about 400 neurons. And you can actually, researchers got this entire network topology because you can slice this uh, worm. You can actually make images of these slices and you can actually detect the connections between these neurons. So in this case, the entire neural network is known as this organism. Uh, however, as you can imagine, more complicated organisms, this is not possible anymore. For example, when the fruit fly has about 100,000 neurons, um, mammals have billions of neurons. It's not possible to get the full uh, network topology anymore. So these are some examples of complex systems that can be modeled in terms of graphs. Let me now go to the theoretical part. So from the theoretical side, most studies have concentrated on all to all interactions. So these are graphs in which every node interacts with every other node. And this is considerably more simple to study because you have law of large numbers, central limit theorem. This um, applies in these systems to some extent, and this simplifies considerably their study. So much research is known about such systems. What is unfortunately much less known is about complex systems defined on sparse random graphs. And that's because these systems are highly heterogeneous. Each node behaves differently from each other node. But in recent years, there's more and more study on these kind of systems. So I will um, discuss that in this talk. So let me first start with uh, what's somehow the paradigmatic model in complex systems theory, which is the spin glass model. And I will discuss what is known in the case of all to all interactions. And then I will discuss uh, dynamical systems. That's the rest search of it all. So let me start with the spin glass problem. This is a very fruitful problem. So much of the methods in complex systems theory were developed in this uh, model. So as the first model that I've studied in my PhD, I started working on this model. And yeah, let me explain how this works. In this case, you have a graph, and this, you have edges on the graph. So these edges can be either 1 minus 1. This is here an example. And then we can assign to the nodes of the graph the variables. Again, they take their binary. It can be either 1 or minus 1. For example, 
this is a possible configuration of the network. You see, we assign here to this node one and to this node minus one and so forth. So there exists to the power n such configurations. Next, we associate a cost to this configuration, and this goes as follows. If the weight of an edge, in this case it's one, equals the product of the variables at the endpoints of the edge, then we add minus one to h. On the other hand, if the weight of the edge is opposite to the product of the endpoints, we add plus one to the h. That's how it works. For example, in this case, we have seven edges which are satisfied. This means that um, the product of these variables equals the weight. So for example, here it's minus one, the weight is minus one. Here it's uh, one and the weight is one. So this is seven. So we get um, minus seven. And then we have two edges which are unsatisfied. We get the two here. So if we add this up, we get that the total cost is minus five, this configuration. Uh, this, however, is not the minimal value. So you can find the configuration for which the total cost is minus seven. That's the minimal configuration. So the spin glass problem is now the following. Spin glass problem is to find the minimal value of H for a given network and a given assignment um, of these weights, GIJ. So in the spin glass problem, these weights are parameters and we draw them from a given probability distribution, usually they are IID, and they take probability one half plus one, uh, probability one half minus one. The sigmas are variable, so we want to find the minimal value of sigma given a certain configuration of weights. So I can tell you this is a very, this is a difficult problem because as you see, the number of configurations scales exponentially in n. So there are two to the power of n configurations. So naively, you will have to go through all of them to find the minimal value. There's a, a problem with exponential complexity because of a large number of configurations. Also, um, you could consider to do some gradient descent, but there's lots of local minima, so that doesn't work either. So in fact, so let's look at the all to all problem. So if you have all to all interactions and the C uh, variables are one, so there is no, there's a trivial topology. So this becomes the cost function. And in this case, so it was, shown by Baharona that uh, this problem is NP-hard. It's really um, proven that it's an exponentially hard problem in the system size. So you, uh, with a modern computer, you wouldn't be able to find a minimum. However, and this is really remarkable, so in uh, 1980 or 1979, uh, Parisi, he actually, in the limit of an infinite size system, if you look at the average value of the minimal value of H, so averaged here is average over the GIJ variables, the edge weights. You take the average over all possible configurations, average minimum, then he developed a method that gives you the minimal value. So even though the problem is NP-hard, you can then determine theoretically the minimal value of this um, cost function, average over all configurations. And Yes, this was, uh, Parisi developed this metal scavity method, replica method to study this problem. And then about uh, 25 years later, Telegram proved this uh, rigorously. So there has been some fruitful mathematics with this as well. Uh, so as well, this problem gave us lots of insights into complex systems. And in fact, so in 21, this was awarded Nobel Prize in physics. So for groundbreaking contributions to the theory of complex systems, is based on the methods to solve this spin glass okay. problem. So this is for all to all interactions. However, uh, what about random graphs? Well, here it's a bit disappointing, I can tell you, because for random graphs, we don't have for now, or it's, maybe it's good, depending on your perspective. But we don't have this estimate yet of what is the um, average value of the minimum. That's, a, that's an open problem. So just to illustrate that um, we know much more in all-to-all -all interactions 
than in problems on random graphs. All right, so let's now go to dynamical systems as a second problem. So if you want to study, say, a neural network or ecosystem, you, in general, you don't have a minimization of a cost function. Instead, what you have is a dynamical system. So you would have um, a differential equation with this form. So here, xi is a variable representing the state of node i. For example, it can be the population abundance of a species. It can be the firing rate, the potential of a neuron, and so forth. And the equation tells you uh, how the variable x at node i changes as a function of the network structure. So here on the right -hand side, you have the influence of the other nodes in the network. Uh, for example, if you study the ecosystem, this will yield a set of lotka volterra equations. If you study a neural network, you have a set of firing rate equations and so forth. So this is, in general, a very difficult problem to solve because it's a set of nonlinear differential equations. You don't have the tools really to solve that. So instead, so what we typically do is we look at something much simpler, try to solve that. And then hopefully we can come back to the more complicated problem and get some insights on that. So here, if we study dynamical systems, the simplest possible problem is a linear problem. In this case, this function here becomes a linear function. It's a sum is basically the adjacency matrix multiplied by the vector x. That's a linear dynamical system. And here you as well see what are the meaning of these edge weights and these diagonal weights. So the diagonal weights basically tell you how fast a variable x in isolation decays to zero, whereas the edge weights tell you the influence of neighboring nodes on the variable, on the change, rate of change x at node i. That's the meaning, concrete meaning of these edge weights and these dynamical systems uh, perspective. So why is a linear system uh, tractable? Well, because we have the explicit solution of a linear dynamical system. We can express, if the matrix A is diagonalizable, we can express x as a sum over the right eigenvectors of this matrix A. And then we have here some prefactors, which is the exponential of the eigenvalues of A times time. So this is an explicit expression for X in terms of the spectral properties of the matrix A. So, if, so what we can conclude, conclude from this is the following. So if you understand how network topology influences the spectrum of a matrix, then from this, then you can understand how a network topology understand, um, that describes the dynamical system through this um, equation here. So this is uh, the approach often followed in dynamical systems theory. So if you look now at this equation, you see you can notice one particular thing, which is that in the sum, if time is large, in the sum, this one term that dominates, which is the term with the largest real part of the eigenvalue lambda j. So that brings us to the concept of a stable matrix. If we um, order the eigenvalues from large, based on the real part from large to small in this way, then we have two possibilities. So first is that the eigenvalue with the largest real part is negative. In this case, it happens that in the limit of large times, the state of a system converges to zero. Uh, so this we call a stable matrix. The stable matrix is a matrix for which all eigenvalues have negative real parts. Then the opposing case is when the real part of the eigenvalue is positive. In this case, what happens is that in the limit of log long times, the norm of this vector diverges. That's the completely opposite case. And such a matrix A, which has this property, is called unstable. This is um, the two um, cases. So let's now, as I mentioned um, before, we had systems with all-to-all -all interactions, which are well understood. And then we have network systems, which are much less understood. So let's have a look what it means for linear systems. So in this case, 
a system with all to all interactions, what we're doing again is we put these C variables to one because everyone interacts with everyone. And the edge weights, G I J, we draw them independent and identically from a given distribution P of J. That defines a linear system with all to all interactions. So if we have seen, if we know the spectral properties of this matrix A, then we can tell what happens in the long time limit um, of this linear dynamical system. So what are the spectral properties of a matrix A with all to all interactions? Well, what happens is, so this, first of all, these eigenvalues occupy the complex plane because these matrices are non-symmetric. So you have an imaginary part of eigenvalues and a real part. And what happens is that these eigenvalues uniformly occupy a disk and the radius of the disk is square root times the size of the matrix times the variance of this J variables. So that's the radius of this disk and the eigenvalues are distributed uniformly on this disk. So this problem effect has a rich history. This was um, first found by Genebre in 65 where he studied the case with Gaussian random variables. And then there was a very influential paper by May in 72, where he conjectured this is true for any uh, independent and identically distributed random variables. So it's much more generally valid. And then there was a whole sequence of intermediate results uh, by mathematicians. And in 2010, it was like, proven rigorously that indeed these eigenvalues occupy uniformly um, the, this disk. So let me now come back um, to this paper by May in 72. So he was studying this in the context of linear dynamical systems. And what he concluded is the following, that since this leading eigenvalue increases as a function of n, if a system is large enough, then if it has to be stable, this variance here has to be very small. So you can't have a very large system with, um, with this, which is heterogeneous. This is the call that diversity complexity trade-off for stable systems. So that's um, mainly for all to all interactions. So let's now have a look what happens with this when we study sparse systems. So random graphs, yes. So let me introduce you um, the main models to study oh, sorry, sparse systems. So the paradigmatic model here is the Aris Renier graph. There's a model that has two parameters. There is the mean out degree, C, and there's a number of nodes, N. That's it. And given these two parameters, you generate graphs as follows. So you say that if you take randomly a pair of nodes, I and J, there is a connection from I to J with probability C divided by N. On the other hand, this connection is absent with the probability one minus C divided by n. So you do this for every pair of nodes in the graph. And then it's fairly, in let's say with Python, you can easily generate such graphs. So here you have an example. This is a Alice Renier graph with mean out degree 1.5 and with, n, with 100 nodes. There's an example of such a random graph. So one issue with this Alice Renier graph is if you now plot the degree distribution, so if you plot the number of links that are instant to a node, then this is a Poisson degree distribution. However, if we re you remember this picture of the internet, uh, real world systems have these hubs, it's very large with nodes with many connections. So we would like to manipulate or change the degree distribution. This yields a different kind of ensemble. These are random graphs with a prescribed degree distribution. So these graphs are generated as follows. You assign to each node a given in and out degree, given a certain prescribed distribution. And then given these um, prescribed in and out degrees, you randomly assign edges between the nodes. This generates some sort of random graph, as you can see here, for the case of a power law random graph. So this is already significantly better because you see here hubs start to appear. So if you have uh, power law random graphs, you have these hubs with very large degrees. And the degrees of these hubs increase with system size. So these are the models that we'll study the spectra from. So let me then um, define the matrix A. These are the graphs. We as well assign now weights to these 
uh, graphs. And we do that in the most simple way. So the graph, as discussed on the previous slide, the graph is a random directed graph with a prescribed distribution of in and out degrees. The weights are assigned independent and identically from a distribution P of J. And the diagonal, the node weights, are as well assigned independent and independently from distribution P of T. But that this defines a random matrix associated with a sparse random graph. And we would like to understand the spectral, the eigenvalues of that matrix. So if you now diagonalize such a matrix, you get this kind of spectrum typically. So this, again, each of these dots represents one eigenvalue in one matrix, in one matrix representing a sparse random directed graph. So these eigenvalues are complex valued because the graph is directed. So here you have the imaginary part, the real part. And what you see is that these eigenvalues are confined in a circle. And the radius of the circle is now given by the following quantity. So it's the square root of C star times the average of J squared. And C star here is not the mean out degree. It's slightly more subtle. It's the out degree when you randomly pick an edge in the graph. So instead of being the out degree when you randomly pick a node, this would be the out degree when you randomly pick an edge in the graph and look at an endpoint of that edge. Um, yes, yeah, so, and all this, so this line here is obtained in the limit where the graph is infinitely large. This is based on a cavity theory sim similar to the middles developed for spin glasses. Then can actually show it in the infinite size limit, all eigenvalues are, or the spectrum has a continuous spectrum and it's this given by this circle here with this radius here. So there's another uh, property you can appreciate, which is that here there is an isolated eigenvalue. This is an eigenvalue outlier. And we also have an analytical expression for that. It's simply C star times the average of the of diagonal weights. So that's what we get uh, for the spectrum of such random directed graphs. So you can now wonder what happens in the middle here. So here you see that the spectrum is not anymore homogeneous. So, but we can as well, we have as well this theory to get spectra of spectral distribution of infinitely large graphs. And yeah, so here you have an example of such a spectrum. So, this, um, so here you have the discrete spectrum of a finite matrix. And this is the corresponding spectrum of the infinitely large random graph, which is continuous because it's an infinitely large system. So. So then we can as well add, oh yeah, sorry. So that's the, like the middle one is a zero mode and then you have the continuous spectrum. Of it. So, uh, the so, middle so the one isolated here, one is a zero mode and then you have a continuous spectrum of the graph. Yes, so in the middle, in fact, there's a delta peak in the middle. Yeah. And um, the weight of a delta peak is the fraction of nodes that do not belong to the strongly connected component. So there is as well some interesting relation in the spectrum and topology of the graph. So that's, uh, there is actually a, a, even a delta peak in the middle. You can actually see that here. Um, yes, so, so we can as well add um, diagonal disorder. In this case, we add uniform diagonal disorder between zero and five. So you can see this dark line here, which is reminiscent this diagonal disorder in the graph. And as well, using this theory, you can get analytical expressions for this boundary. At least you can show that this boundary is solved by this simple equation here. And the outlier is um, solved by this equation. So you can get um, equations in the limit of infinitely large graphs on the boundary of the continuous spectrum and the outlier. So, yes, so let's now look at stability. Let's use this to look at the stability of linear dynamical systems. So we have seen that this is determined by the leading eigenvalue, the eigenvalue with the largest real part. So we will have to look at the one which is largest, which is in this case, the outlier. So you can then get this kind of stability diagrams. So this diagram tells you for which parameters the random graph governs a stable system and when it's unstable. So here on the y-axis, we have this mean out degree. 
Now on the x-axis, we have the variance in the edge weights, so how heterogeneous the edge weights of the graphs are. And so you'll see is that if the graph has low connectivity and the edge weights have less heterogeneity, then the system is stable. However, if you increase the connectivity or you increase its heterogeneity, then the system becomes unstable. You can get this um, analytical diagram from studying the spectral properties of these random graphs. Yeah, and what's kind of remarkable is that the stability does not depend on the degree fluctuations. It only depends on the mean out degree. That was something we kind of found surprising. Also here, it doesn't depend on the higher moments. See. So there is one more thing which I hope you can appreciate, which is explain the following, which is that um, the eigenvalue of a random directed graph is finite. So if you take the limit, if you have seen the limit of an infinity, the spectrum is confined in a finite region of the complex plane. And in, in fact, that's surprising because the norm of the matrix diverges in the limit of infinite large systems, but the leading eigenvalue is finite. So that's a, that's a bit weird. On the other hand, to add to this, if you look at a non-directed system, then the eigenvalue diverges in the limit of infinite sizes. So you see that the nature of the interactions, you can have systems with finite, with spectra confined in a compact region of the complex plane or spectra which um, stretch to infinity, just based on changing the nature of the signs of the interactions. So we call such systems absolutely stable. And that's because if the leading eigenvalue is negative, it will be negative for all system sizes. The system size does not play a big role in stability of such systems. On the other hand, such systems, we, we speak of size dependent stability. That's because if a system is stable for a certain system size, then it will get unstable if you are large enough. So eventually, systems that are large enough will eventually get unstable. We speak about size dependent stability. So you can now ask the question, so directed graphs, they are absolutely stable, the eigenvalue is finite. Um, Non-directed graphs have infinite eigenvalue. So what about other sign patterns? For example, we have seen ecosystems have antagonistic interactions. Uh, how about that? Does that affect these two scenarios. So let's therefore look at the following cases. So we have this kind of antagonistic systems. So these systems have sign antisemitic interactions. These are predator prey interactions, as in ecosystems. But just to note that we're only fixing here the sign of the interactions, not their absolute values. So the the weight in the positive direction can be different from the weight in the negative direction. Uh, we're only fixing the sign. So it's not the same as an anti-symmetric matrix. Then we have this oriented case, which are case of uh, unidirectional interactions as neural networks. And then we have the case, what we call a mixture. In a mixture, we have three types of interactions. We have the sign anti-symmetric interactions, we have competitive interactions, which are minus minus, and we have what we call mutualistic interactions, which are plus plus. So uh, a graph that has a combination of that, we call that a mixture graph. So now let's look at the leading eigenvalue in these different cases. So for this, we consider the following kind of matrix. So it's very similar to the matrix we discussed before. The only thing is that the graph is non-directed, but we add the GIJ, they are now correlated. So GIJ is correlated to GGI because we draw them independently from a joint distribution. And this allows us to have anti-symmetric, symmetric interactions and so forth. So because of, we draw them from a joint distribution. So apart from that, the model is the same. Okay, so then so we got, then we studied this problem, we got this graph. So let me go through it. So here we have the average real part of the leading eigenvalue, because the eigenvalue with the largest real part. And you see that for a mixture ensemble, so it has a mixture of interactions, 
if you increase the size of the graph or the number of nodes in the graph, this leading eigenvalue diverges. On the other hand, if the graph has signed antisymmetric interactions as antagonistic, then if you increase the size of the graph, then is this finite. So this we were when we, we completely didn't expect that. So we found this, we were really awestruck because again the norm of this matrix diverges, but the leading eigenvalue is finite. So that's really weird. So here you see we have a finite leading eigenvalue. And let me as well stress that the markers here are direct diagonalization. The solid line is theory and in the infant size limit. So we have this cavity theory based on spin losses, and you see it matches very well to direct diagonalization, but which um, this confirms this is not a finite size effect, confirms that really um, in the infant size limit it's finite. Oh, yes, please. It's constant. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's got, I think it's maybe two or something like that or four. I don't remember the exact number, but it's, it's finite and constant. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, it doesn't scale with the size of the network. Yeah, so. um, no, it doesn't. But the, the weights, still the, the degree distribution is unbounded. It's Poissonian, it's unbounded. So that makes that the norm of the matrix still diverges. So you have an unbounded degree distribution. And yeah, because you get nodes of any um, of arbitrary large degrees when n becomes large. Right. Yeah. So that, that's why uh, yeah, that's why the result is, is non-trivial. If the degrees were bounded, it would be it would be trivial. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the so this is a fine. Yeah. So let me as well stress that um, so this dashed line is not theory, this dashed line is just guide to the eye. However, uh, we can do the theory for the mixture case, and we find this divergent the leading eigenvalue. So it's consistent. Direct diagonalizations are consistent with theory as well in the mixture case. So then there's another kind of interesting result I want to maybe highlight, which is that so normally, if you increase fluctuations in the system, it becomes less stable. But interestingly, in the antagonistic case, it's the opposite. So in the antagonistic ensemble, if you increase the degree fluctuations, then the stable region um, increases, as you can see here for mean out degree four and here for mean out degree three. Whereas, say, in a, let's say a directed system, if you increase degree fluctuations, the stable region becomes smaller. That's what we usually expect in complex systems. You increase fluctuations, systems become less stable, but remarkably, in antagonistic systems, it's the opposite. That's also quite interesting. So we can now have a look at the full spectrum. So we have seen that the a spectrum of these antagonistic matrices are finite. They're confined in a compact region of the complex plane. So let's look how the, the spectra look like completely, fully. So this is for mean out degree four, spectrum of an antagonistic matrix. This is for mean out degree two. So you see this, how this is confined in the complex plane. So this is, this line here is again, the theory for infinitely large graphs. And you see there's this peculiar thing that at low degrees, the leading eigenvalue is imaginary. See, because there's this reentrance behavior here. There's some interesting things happening there too. Let's now look at the mixture case to understand what's actually going on. And here, again, we have the, the finite, the finite um, size results are quite fluctuating because of the finite size matrices. But if we look at the theory, which is a solid line, you see that here um, tails start to emerge on the real axis. That's the reason that the leading eigenvalue diverges because you have um, the tails popping up in the real axis. So you could, you could now be happy because uh, we have a theory that describes the results. It fits direct diagonalization. But in fact, when we got this, I wasn't really happy because still we don't really understand what's going on. 
that you have theory, it fits diagonalizations, fine, but why is it really that here there are these steels and here they are not? That, that's what we'd like to discuss next. So, and for this, we were digging a bit deeper into the literature in the past, and we discovered this very interesting concept of science stability, which is something that was studied in the 60s and 70s by uh, quantitative economists and quantitative ecologists. So what's that? So a, a matrix A is science stable if all matrices B with the same sign pattern are stable. So if you fix the sign pattern, you vary the strength of the, you arbitrarily vary the strength of the sign of the weights, all these matrices are stable. So let me give you some examples. So this is an example of a sign stable matrix because these are the two eigenvalues of this matrix. So you see, no matter how large A11 is, and no matter how large A22 is, the eigenvalues will be negative. That's a sign stable matrix. So if you fix the sign pattern, this determines the stability of the system. The weights don't matter, which is actually quite, I will explain you later why people were interested in that. So this is a matrix which is not sign stable. And the reason it's not sign stable is because you see if this A12, A21 is large enough, then uh, one of these two eigenvalues will be positive. This one will become positive. This is not a sign stable matrix. So the reason people were interested in sign stability is because in empirical data, you often don't know the weights. In economical data, logical data, you don't, it's very hard to determine um, the interaction strength of, the, of these weights, it's fairly easy to determine the sign pattern. That's why uh, people were interested in this sign stability. So what's remarkable, so this seems like a very strong constraint, but however, you can um, derive sufficient and necessary conditions for sign stability. And these are the, the, those conditions. So a matrix is sign stable if the following three conditions are satisfied. So first, the diagonal elements are negative. There's a minus here, this is positive, it's negative. Um, then how about the weights? Well, the weights, they have to be either sign antisymmetric or unidirectional. So here you see things popping up. This corresponds to antagonistic, this becomes, becomes the directed case. And then there's a third condition, which means that, is that you, you can't have feedback cycles. We can't have cycles larger than three. So from the third condition, we can conclude uh, naturally that random graphs are not sign stable because random graphs have a lot of cycles. So sign stability is definitely excluded. However, you see we have still this coincidence of sign and symmetry and unidirectionality. So what we somehow conclude is the following. So random graphs are still locally sign stable. So if you would pick up a node and look at the finite neighborhood, then this finite neighborhood is sign stable if the, large, the graph is large enough. With probability one, any local neighborhood becomes sign stable if the graph is large. So from this, uh, we conclude that, um, or we conjecture at least, that local sign stability implies absolute stability. That's um, how we understand this. So let's, to check whether this indeed works, let's look at which kind of topologies are locally sign stable. So we have the uh, unidirectional interactions. We have these antagonistic um, graphs. So here the red represents a positive interaction, green negative. And then there's as well other things like graphs which have beat uh, forward cycles as well locally sign stable. So all these random, if you construct random graphs out of these structures, they're conjectured to have a finite leading eigenvalue on average. Um, and then we can look at structures which are not locally sign stable. So we have these mixture graphs, but interestingly as well, you can have antagonistic systems with cycles. If you have the pre-interactions, but you have these cycles, then you're not locally sign stable. So this random graph should have a divergent leading eigenvalue if what we uh, conjecture is correct. So let's 
test this. So here we have the three ensembles. So the red one is the case of the antagonistic Adjus Venue graph. So this one is locally sign stable and indeed converged to a finite value, as we have seen before. But here, this is the interesting one. This is the case of an antagonistic graph built out of these motifs. It's called the Husimi graph, has these um, cycles of length four. But the interactions are all pair to pair interactions. And you see this seems to diverge in the limit of large n. And this is um, the thing we had before it's the mixture case, which also diverges. So that works, at least the numerical evidence seems to confirm this. Uh, right. And then here we can as well look at the spectra. This might be even more convincing. So here we have the spectrum of the sign, locally sign stable random graph. So you see it's confined, seems to be confined in the complex plane, especially note that there are no tails on the real axis. This is the mixture case. So here you see these tails form the real axis and this is the antagonistic with symmetry. So this one has this um, cycles of length four, but it's antagonistic. So here the local sign stability is broken by the topology, not by the sign of the interactions. But if you break it by the topology, you as well get a system that have divergent leading eigenvalue. So how, so let me maybe go to, this is the final slide. slide. So how about um, food webs? Are they locally sign stable? So that's of course not an answerable question because food webs are finite, and not infinitely large. However, I mean, from this, we learned that antisymmetric interactions are stabilizing. And yes, food webs have pre, -pre interactions, so that's satisfied. But as well, uh, from this, we learned that there should be a small number of cycles because cycles tend to destabilize food webs. Um, so is this really the case? Let's look at some data. So this is um, data from Dunner in 2002. So what they did is they, they looked at a whole bunch of networks in literature. So these include social networks like co-author networks, the World Wide Web, um, so neural networks, but as well, as well includes food webs. So here are the food webs. And then, so they compared, this is the clustering coefficient as a way to quantify how many cycles graph has. So they divide, the empirical value of the clustering coefficient by the clustering coefficient of a random graph with the same um, degree distribution. So if this is of order one, it means that the graph has the same number of cycles as a random graph. If this is larger, then it has a much higher number of cycles in the random graph. So what's kind of interesting is that you see that um, all these networks here have a very large number of cycles. So they are the three order of magnitudes larger than uh, the random case. However, the foot webs are at the bottom here and they have, they are the same magnitude as a random graph. So that at least seems to be consistent uh, with the concept that um, cycles are destabilizing. So, so yeah, so let me, um, thank um, all the collaborators who have worked on um, work related to this. And um, yes, this is some uh, discussion. So we have seen that this kind of local sign stability uh, determines the complexity rate of or stable complex systems defined in random graphs. And so from what, what we can learn from that is that for random graphs, at least, different than from fully connected systems, the sign pattern really matters for the stability of a system. And there's two types of sign patterns which are which um, which stand out as being stabilizing, which are those that are sign and symmetric, and those that are unidirectional. And there's a third uh, property that is stabilizing, which is that you have locally a tree topology, which means that you have a small number of uh, small cycles. Oh, yes. 
Yes, that's yeah. So thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thanks a lot uh, for the very nice talk. We have time for questions. Yes. Please uh, use a microphone. Hi. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Uh, so I was wondering if any of the rules which you defined would hold for a system with nonlinear interactions? Yeah, that's... Or it all goes down the trash as soon as we add it. Yeah, that's a very... Yeah, that's, of course, a very interesting question. That's, the, um, I think, the question to look at next. How has local science stability an effect for systems with nonlinear interactions? Uh, but there is... I think there, there's good hope. And there are some, for example, there was a paper as well written in the 80s where people shown that on a tree, so not on a random graph, but on a tree, if you have antagonistic interactions and um, if the system has a fixed point, if a local Volterra system has a fixed point, then this is the unique equilibrium point of the system on the condition that um, the graph is a tree and it's antagonistic. So that, that's the, as far as I know, the, the only result which is out there. So, but yeah, I think this is, yeah, this would be very interesting to investigate what are the implications uh, for nonlinear systems, uh, local science stability. Yes. Yeah, so when like, uh, when you introduce the like, signs on these uh, random graphs and directions, mm -hmm. uh, if I think of like mapping the system to some kind of a spin glass system, are we talking about like presence of, can, can, can we, sorry, map this to presence of frustration in these graphs? And you can think of this uh, local science stability as uh, like frustration free uh, configurations or something. Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to map it on a spin glass because, um, for a spin glass, you basically need a Lyapunov function. Like the dynamical spin glass is a minimization of a cost function. And you can, a dynamical system corresponds to a spin glass system, or if it has a it's called Lyapunov function, this means that there is a function that decreases as a function of time um, if in your dynamical system. And so if you have this Lyapunov function, then you can think on how to map this on a spin glass. But in general, there is no level of function in MCO systems. So that, that makes it, um, yeah, it's not uh, really clear how to um, relate these two things. One more. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, like you were, I think, working mostly on these matrices were square matrices. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. have you ever considered like looking at systems, like, for example, the incidence matrix is a rectangular matrix and looking at the SVD instead? Yeah, um, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, uh, but yeah. Other questions? If not, let's, thanks, Isaac, again.